ನಮೋಥಸ ಭಗವತೋ ಅರ್ಹತೋ ಸಮ್ಮ ಸಂಭೂತ ಸ ನಮೋಥಸ ಭಗವತೋ ಅರ್ಹತೋ ಸಮ್ಮ ಸಂಭೂತ ಸ ನಮೋಥಸ ಭಗವತೋ ಅರ್ಹತೋ ಸಮ್ಮ ಸಂಭೂತ ಸ ಅಪರುತ ದೈಸಂಗಮತಸರ ಏ ಸೊರ್ವಂಥ ಬಮುಂಜಂಥು ಸಥ ಸೊ ದಿಸ್ ಆಫ್ಟರ್ನೂನ್ ಇಸ್ ಆಪರ್ಚುನಿಟಿ ಟು ರಿಫ್ಲೆಕ್ಟ್ ಟು my reflection as i point out every time i give these talks is to be aware of how what i say affects you so you're not just listening to words or having to think about the words that you hear but using the situation to be aware of how these kind of words affect you whether you you know you like them or don't like them or you doubt them or you don't understand or you do it's only something that you can know yourself giving public talks putting yourself into a position of giving public talks and you people listen you know with a critical mind is it a good talk or a bad talk or boring or interesting or true or false but this is not reflective awareness is not about true or false good or bad but it's the way things are how you know how the words affect you because words do affect us emotionally so just observing one's thinking process you begin to see how changeable the personality is how you can be inspired or depressed or elated or doubtful or on your mood will change according to what you you thinking or hearing but taking the position of the witness the puto is not a critical not not being critical but aware that but aware of the way we think and tend to re- react to what we hear and what we feel so in terms of polygrammer we call it baramata satcha or ultimate truth or samut such a conventional truth so samut such a such a in pali means truth paramata such a is paramata is ultimate or absolute truth so taking the position of paramata such a is taking this reflective ability we have to just be the witness because what we think and how we think or our emotions react to the what you hear this time is is not you know it's not that can be criticized this samut such a the conventional world is about good and bad right and wrong so when i use the puto mantra puto is a kind of it's a samut such a it's a word but it gives that we when we when i hear this word bhuto it means being aware of the way it is as i experience life through my body and senses 
And then we refer to that all conditions are impermanent. Sapay Sankarani Cha, this is a this is a wisdom teaching. Sape Sankarani Cha. This is where wisdom operates through us. When we get into our critical mode, then it's conventional. It can be, you know, skillful or unskillful or just uh, whatever critical words you might apply to, to yourself or to others. So just notice, you know, and you observe how the, these poly words, I like to use them because it's part of this tradition. Lung Pao Cha was always reflecting on Bharamata Satcha and Samut Satcha. So I have a tendency to like those two terms, but they also may not mean anything to you. So when I say Bharamata Satcha, how does that affect you? It's like this. Whether you, you know, because I told you the translation in English. But when I gave the, after the Namo Tassa, I said, Aparu Tadi Sangama Tassa Tower, what, what am I saying, you know, if you're not a Pali scholar or a monk or a nun, then you, Aparu Tadi Sangama Tassa Tower, it's a ceremonial chant. What does it mean? But we might know it's just what Ajahn Sumedho does on these desanas, these reflective reflections on here and now, the way it is. So Bharamatta Satcha is not critical, it's not, a, it's not divided into good or bad, right or wrong. We call it absolute reality. And uh, that's our ultimate reality, ultimate truth. These are adequate descriptions of it when referring to it. But in culture, in um, Cultural conditioning, social conditioning, we don't, we can understand the, that it's absolutely true and ultimate. These are superlatives in the English language, but then uh, what does it do to me, a mortal being, a body? A man or a woman, what does that, what does that mean to me in my life? Because the delusion is that we are the convention or reality. This is a basic avicca, is that, that I am this body, I am this personality. But then in meditation, in vipassana, is insight into the way it is. And so we can grasp the words, all conditions are impermanent, and we can understand that intellectually, you know, it makes sense. But uh, everything we identify with we've been conditioned by is, is uh, you know, means that it's impermanent and empty. It's not, you know, am I just an empty form sitting here in this seat expounding or reflecting on Dhamma? And of course, egotistically, one doesn't want to be just another empty phenomena just, uh, you know, what is the body empty? And, you know, I look at the body and it seems more solid than 
anything, having to live with a 90-year-old body. And then the senses, the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, and the body itself, and the, the mental states, the emotions, the memories are very fleeting. So what is aware of impermanence? You know, what can, as, can an impermanent condition be aware of another impermanent condition? If I'm really this body and I'm Ajahn Sumedho as my ultimate realization, then have I spent all these years just as a sankara contemplating other sankaras? What is it that I do, what I've learned, what I've realized insightfully, is I'm not these conditions. Now this is not just taking another stand intellectually like I'm convincing myself I'm nobody or an, I'm an empty phenomena, but when you reflect on the way it is, you begin to go inward rather than seeking uh, answers uh, from suttas or scriptures or dictionaries. And this is where learning to trust in awareness is the gate to the deathless. Aparuta di sangha matasa taura. The deathless amatasa taura, taura's gate or door. So Bharamata Satcha is here and now, and it's so it's it's uh, when but when we just operate from the conventional conditioning of the ego and the culture, and education, modern education, modern attitudes, modern science is very much with that basic delusion. Then. Of course, we, we see ourselves only through conventional reality, samut satcha. So then, samut means that because I was born, I will die. And my, my life, if I've lived my life, affirming myself as a separate personality, as a aging form in, in a conventional sense, then what is death to, to an aging body or an, an old person? You know, and it's, you try to think of, you have various scenarios about what happens when people die, reincarnation, rebirth, go to heaven, go to hell, or just oblivion. And sometimes absolute reality seems like oblivion to the thinking mind, because you can't get beyond it. You can't, you can't objectify absolute reality. You can't see it, smell it, taste it, touch it. You've got these words, absolute reality, or some bhāramata satcha, good enough, but they're also impermanent conditions. So then, in investigation, dhamma vichaya is a Pali word for investigating, going inward, rather than outward, not trying to find who am I? Noticing on YouTube all these videos on psychology about trying to find who you really are as a person. Where do I fit in? What am I really? And we want to find a, a, an identity which is another empty phenomenon. So we identify with the right or the left or with 
being a man or a woman or being black or white, nor we identify with gender roles, we identify with nationality, with race. These are all identities that are worldly identities. They're all uh, samutsacha, conventions. But if all this is empty phenomena, then who am I? And of course, I'm, I'm an empty phenomenon, is the logical answer to that question. <laughs> who am I? And then uh, ego conditioning doesn't want to be a, just an empty phenomenon. You want to be somebody. Am I success or failure or powerful or weak or cowardly or better than the rest or just like everybody else, I'm just a normal person or I'm inferior? Or these identities will people seek to, to just identify as something because being nobody, being an empty phenomenon is for the way we're conditioned is unbearable. To see yourself, this form sitting here in this seat is, is an empty phenomenon, speaking words that are empty phenomena. So what's left, you know, and then it's going, taking this to the extreme, that all conditions are impermanent. Every, it's, there's no exceptions. When the Buddha said, Sapa Sankarani Cha, he was not saying, well, there's some conditions that are permanent and others that aren't. It's not a question of, of uh, justifying or trying to find a permanent condition. Because you'll never do it. You can't do it. So what, then ask yourself, what is it or who is it that's aware of empty conditions? When you begin to see all phenomena as empty, then it suddenly its quality is not so important. <clears throat> they share this, this same uh, quality of emptiness. All conditions are impermanent. Then the question again, what is it that is aware of the presence and absence of phenomena? And then we begin to reflect more that this awareness, the gate to the deathless, real, ultimate reality, varmata sacha, is what we really are. This is, this is what we use when we reflect on the way it is. Just by observing your own thoughts or emotions. Have you tried to just be the witness to emotional states? Because emotions are very convincing. You know, rationally, intellectually, we can justify almost anything. <clears throat> but emotions are not rational. But they're about feeling and uh, good or feeling bad, feeling elated or depressed, feeling loved or hated, feeling alone, feeling powerful, feeling weak and helpless. When somebody we love dies, then the grief is a feeling we, we experience. Just the change in the weather can, you know, the emotion 
will state that we experience changes according, according to time of day or whether it's sunny or hot or warm or cold. And the witness position is just aware of the changingness that we experience through this body and senses. It's very impermanent and changeable and unstable and untrustworthy. And by keeping reminding by keeping in reminding yourself of this, you begin to notice, begin to have insight into what you really are, which is Bharamatta Satcha. So that's quite a powerful insight. That's what enlightenment is about, is when you realize for yourself, you're not coming from the thinking mind of, I am an enlightened person, that suddenly that those kind of words are empty. I, as a personal pronoun, is empty. And so on, all words are empty, whether they're Pali or Sanskrit or English or any other language. So when we <clears throat> live our life just quoting scriptures, memorizing chants. That can be skillful means. But we may know all the Buddhist teachings in the various schools of Buddhism, but not realizing one's true nature because you're, you're still caught in the throws of thinking and words and books and what teachers tell you. Now to realize your true nature is called insight. Because this, these forms that we identify with are very, well, we've been so conditioned program to believe in. And we have to live in a sensitive form for a lifetime. And it is, of course it suffers from sicknesses, pandemics, loss of loved ones, and they're all going to die anyway. So, you know, this, this is a kind of futile refuge in the birth and death cycles of phenomena. But the liberation is realizing the emptiness of phenomena is the way it is. Like, we, when you look at yourself as a, as a person, as a personality, then you tend to see yourself in, you know, oftentimes they're being critical, you see faults or weaknesses that you're embarrassed with, or shame and guilt, or, or maybe you're a narcissist and you think you're the only one who knows what's right and wrong, and, and, uh, you know, you can convince yourself that you're, you're the king of the world. And so these are just ways of developing the ego, which is a lack of awareness, lack of investigation. <clears throat> Even, you know, whether you think you're the greatest person or the most insignificant person or the worst person or just an ordinary guy, just an ordinary, humble person that's all rubbish. You're none of that. And when you begin to abide in this awareness, 
Bharamata Satcha, then you experience a sense of relief that you don't have to justify yourself or prove anything or do anything or get rid of anything. You realize the perfection of Dhamma. And this is like consciousness, pure consciousness, not consciousness through the senses, but what allows the senses to see, hear, smell, taste, touch, think, and feel, if there was no ultimate consciousness, maramatta consciousness, then there would be nothing. There would be no earth, fire, water, air, space, they couldn't exist because there's no, if, if it wasn't for consciousness. So consciousness is the background of everything. It has no birth and death and you can't see it or know it, smell it, taste it, touch it, because it's like trying to do that to yourself, you know, you you can't find yourself. You want to seek an identity or get an identity from somebody else. But all identities are empty. Whether you're the most powerful, wonderful man or woman in the whole universe or the weakest, doesn't matter because these identities are all empty. And then Dhamma, the word Dhamma, is absolute reality. It's here and now and timeless. So try to imagine timelessness. And you can't do it. It just, you know, with these forms are all about time. Earth, fire, water, air, space are all about time. Because they have a beginning and an ending. But consciousness has no beginning or ending. So it's timeless. So when you realize that, then you still live in the conventional world but you're no longer deluded by it. And you have this right understanding, samaditi, right understanding, meaning perfect understanding. It's not just the right, it's perfect. And the Eightfold Path flows from that. And we live our remaining lives in these forms, doing good and refraining from doing evil, but it's no longer from personal ideas of good and bad or skillful or unskillful. It's, it's responding skillfully to the here and now realities that we experience through the forms, through the senses. So learning to abide in silence, in pure consciousness, is the path. So the path is right understanding, right intention, right action, right speech, right livelihood. So like this uh, form, the monastic form, this traditional form uh, that we have taken on is about right action, right speech, right livelihood. 
But it's not like a personal, I have to, I, it's not taken personally anymore, it's just natural. Right speech, right action, right livelihood are natural responses to experience. So it's not personal, it's not like I'm trying to practice right speech or right, and I'm developing right livelihood or right action. It's, it's spontaneous because the, then the forms that we still have are used for metta, karuna, mudita, upeka, the Brahma Viharas, for loving kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity. So these Brahma Viharas, they're not personal anymore. It's not like I'm trying to, as a Buddhist monk, spreading metta to all sentient beings, and that makes it very personal, like I'm doing this as a personal act, but it's natural. It's responding to what's left of the, condi the condition phenomenon that still has to grow old, get sick and die. So it's like in uh, try telling people they're perfect. Is, how does that affect you? <laughs> because uh, sometimes we feel very imperfect as as uh, entities. But if I tell you you're perfect already no matter what you've done or said in the past, you know, it's a challenge to seeing yourself as a personality with the past or realizing your true nature here and now, apparent here and now, timeless. A hipasico, see for yourself, know this yourself. But I was told when I was by my parents that I was born in, in, as a sinner. So that's a different, when, when you feel you've been born in sin, it kind of, how does that affect you? You know, you see yourself as a form, uh, as a child, and your mother tells you that all human beings are sinners, born in sin, and that's a very negative way to look at yourself. It's quite depressing. Then you spend your life with that perception ingrained through religious teachers and quotes from sacred texts. But if you're told you're perfect, you know, on the ego level, that ego how does that affect you when you start thinking for yourself? Well, to know that perfection is apparent here and now suddenly takes the onerous tone out of mortal existence. because you realize there's nothing to do, nothing to worry about, that the forms that we see as uh, through the samutsacha are just empty forms working out their karma, in which they r realize they, they have this, this teaching been available for thousands of years already, it's not like a new age philosophy. But why are people the way they are? Why, do, why is there war and hatred and violence and 
and uh, so much strife in the world. Every morning, I listen to the BBC World Service to catch up on all the misery of the world. And, and you know, you think, well, if, if everybody knew they were perfect, they wouldn't do that. Yeah, there's no way you want to kill anybody that from the pure, perfect awareness. As a person, you can feel like you want to do that. But when you abide in the perfect reality, ultimate reality, then you don't, you have metta and compassion and joy and equanimity as a relating to the world that you experience through the senses in the body. So Buddhism is basically a very joyful teaching. Because it's, it's uh, you know, the, the thing that many of us have been attracted to Buddha, Buddha teaching is the fact that it's about practical ways of investigating existence. Not just defining yourself as a Buddhist or, because that can be very personal. You know, what kind of Buddhist are you? And, and uh, you can have our various opinions about Buddhism and Mahayana, Vajrayana, Hinayana, and, and these are all empty, phenomenal words. But we can give them great importance by attaching our emotional identity with one and one or the other, until we realize that the very basic teaching, the first sermon of the Buddha after his enlightenment, according to the scriptures, is not about Hinayana, Mahayana, Vajrayana. It's about suffering and the causes of suffering and the end of suffering and the way to live life not suffering. So I think that's enough for this afternoon.